So what? Off. Okay. You like one yeah. quarter essentially. Yeah. In between jump rope and swimming. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started here. It's uh, 1 30, and uh, we are meeting in our uh, community development Dakota room uh, today instead of council chambers. So that's the change of venue that we have. Um, so uh, for those who are here, uh, if you could just go around and uh, say who you are, uh, just in case people are having a tough time uh, seeing you online. Jerome Christensen. Lydia Boyson. Scott Moxtenix. Ethan Wilkins. All right, and it looks with us like uh, with us online, we have Chris Stout, Jim Gorblish, Jessica Remington, and Nancy Denzer, as well as Luke Sims. And Sam. And I'm on too. Yep. Rebecca Lamberty is on. Okay. And Rebecca is here too. All right. Wow. Are you, um, this is Nancy. Um, are you in City Hall someplace? Ah, well, yes. you are in City Hall too. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, we are I am, but I'm not where you are. All right. Just I'm head down the stairs. Yeah, Ethan will come and get you. Yeah. I'll, I'll... Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, no. I read my I read my direct. Okay. Welcome, everybody. All right. So um, at the last meeting, we were uh, at the end of the last meeting, there were a couple of different topics that we were thinking about talking about either the incubator space or housing. Um, I am meeting with the housing subcommittee this afternoon. And so we'll, we will talk about a housing project at our next meeting. For today, um, what I have kind of queued up here is a discussion about and incubator space, uh, which is one of the highest, higher ranking uh, projects that we talked about. And so for that, what I'll start with and pass out here is I just did, of course, a quick Google search on definitions on you know incubators and maker space. And so I'll bring it up for those who are joining us, who are joining us online. Um, and we can take a look at that as well as what we already have in our 2007 comprehensive plan um, related to something similar, I would say kind of in the same vein, um, an arts district uh, in a designated uh, six block area in the downtown of Winona. And so I'll bring that up on our screen right here. So right up at the top, you can see the difference between business incubators and makerspace. I just have the two definitions in there. And you know, I, I guess my first question is in terms of scope for uh, something like this, is there anything missing um, related to this um, that you don't see between those two kind of definitions there, business incubators and makerspaces? Um, taking a look at the Arts District, and I'll just talk a little bit more about what else is on this page here. Um, the 2007 downtown plan notes an art, arts district in a roughly six block area south of Fort Street and west of Main Street in downtown Winona. Um, this is the area where you can see right now in 2007, this is uh, what the comprehensive plan had programmed for the Main Square area. And hey, lo and behold, uh, we have a project there. Mm -hmm. um, so long to parties, had a couple of late night burgers there, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, just south of that, uh, we have our senior center, Masonic Lodge, um, the, uh, the church area that we have for Wesley, our library, 
Um, and then the uh, auditorium, which was uh, brought down uh, not too long ago here, but that this is the location for the uh, Masterpiece Hall that's uh, proposed. In addition, there's designated areas for kind of uh, redevelopment or renovation um, in this area. And I just bring this up too, because uh, this um, area was uh, noted as an area for um, some potential uh, arts programming and arts space, uh, particularly related to the Masonic uh, Theater and the Masonic Temple. In addition, the, uh, there has been some discussion uh, really at the end of last year, taking a look at the Masonic Temple for a number of different things um, uh, in terms of performing arts, of course, um, offices for arts organizations, um, recording studio, all included as part of uh, the Masonic Temple building, using the theater's kitchen as a food business incubator, and then the potential for a community wood shop, which I think kind of gets to our makerspace um, uh, discussion that we uh, had as part of this. So I just wanted to provide that for uh, your information so you have that kind of in the back of your head, you know, whether the Masonic is something that this committee would like to um, talk about further or maybe a different location, just to note that those are um, some specific general areas in downtown and then a specific building that has kind of um, been talked about for something similar to what we've discussed. So I'll stop there and ask if there's any comments, additions, or clarifications. Okay. Anybody online have any comments or questions? <clears throat> Nothing for me, thanks. Okay. What, um, this is Jim Goblish, what scale of project are we thinking this needs to be to be transformative? Um, thinking something that fits within a small footprint like the Masonic Lodge may not be substantial enough, although the building does you know, need to have some programmatic improvements as well as physical improvements. Definitely. And maybe those who um, had originally um, brought this up as something to take a look at, um, if you had some thoughts about what you would think uh, would make this transformational, I mean, just off the top of my head, you know, I can think of um, the what could result from bringing people together as part of a project like this uh, could have a tremendous impact. But um, those who, uh, in essence, voted for something uh, like this, um, maybe if you could provide some background on uh, what you think could be transformational about it. Sure, I can try to chime in here. Um, this is something, you know, in my mind that um, I guess I'm leaning more towards the business side of it, um, mm -hmm. certainly not to exclude, you know, more of a makerspace kind of uh, aspect. But as far as businesses go, um, something to make it, you know, sort of as easy as possible to start a business here. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, for me, you know, kind of personal example is the egg rolls that I get, you know, buy them out of, you know, an apartment in good view and I've talked with her a lot about opening up a restaurant um and you know she seems like she'd like to but it you know it can be difficult obviously uh and if there were some sort of facility some sort of infrastructure you know both physical and uh kind of mentorship to help support her to get going and then eventually move into something more substantial to me that's kind of what I envision um and it's interesting when we uh went to the um Strong Towns presentation of uh, Chuck Marone. Uh, he referenced uh, Muskegon, Michigan as an example of a place that has that. Um, and it actually fits in pretty well with the vision, you know, the, the actual visual vision that I had um, for kind of what I was thinking about, you know, basically small shacks uh, with low rent um, and, you know, purposeful high turnover to move into new locations. So for me, it's something like that. Mm -hmm. 
picking up on that. I mean, I know in Minneapolis, I think it was on Chicago uh, Avenue, basically, if I'm remembering right, a little bit north of where George Floyd Square is now, um, in the kind of 30s. Uh, there was a food business incubator where it was kind of a, a commercial kitchen uh, that you could use uh, to get your, you know, your whatever it would be, whether it be a food truck or, you know, take out or an actual brick and mortar store kind of up and running and kind of test out ideas to scale and things like that. And so if we wanted to go specifically towards a food business incubator kind of along the lines of what's listed, uh, here, that's a possibility too. Um, in terms of, I think another permutation I remember from the brainstorming early on was something kind of like, is it called the global market on um, Lake? Yeah, yeah, where you have small restaurants and you have kind of, as Ethan was describing, stalls uh, mm -hmm. that are pretty small uh, and people sell goods of various kinds and you know depending on the business there's some turnover but I know I mean it's I haven't been there in a few years but I know a lot of them stuck around too because that was a good size for them they didn't want a huge brick and mortar mm -hmm. um, and that was good and so so that would rather than being necessarily a space where you made your things like a maker space or an incubator, it would be a place where small businesses could get a foothold mm -hmm. because they didn't have to do the, the rent probably would be more yeah reasonable yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, and so it was a whole lot of stuff in one space um, that people could kind of walk through that would presumably I don't know presumably keep rents lower for everyone. And also kind of create a hub for people to kind of go and find different things. That wouldn't really fit in the Masonic. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but maybe there's somewhere else in town where it might fit. I really like I really like that idea just because it, you know, it helps people who may they may never want to have a brick and mortar. They may just feel, you know, comfortable in their small space with the, you know, what they're providing. And it's it, I really like the egg rolls that it's somebody that's giving you know, giving, you know, a service that, you know, people really, you know, want to take advantage of, but, you know, they want to do that, you want to go get them, and then you could, it's like a food court, you know, that concept of all over the place, you can get, you know, a choice, and it helps, you know, the community, it helps them, and it's a service, the kinds of things you want to do. You know, I really hear a three different phases of development here you know the maker spaces where people are developing their offering their product their whatever they're going to do they need to uh, be able to do that with the pro appropriate resources then the business incubators commercializing that how am i going to offer it to the public how am i going to promote how am i going to finance and then the last one you know that scott brought up was operational location that doesn't require brick and mortar because that's often an obstacle you know to take your idea from the commercialization to a reality you don't have want to have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars necessarily and what were you going to say um yeah i was just uh thinking that you know we we immediately um go to thinking of uh, physical spaces that in many cases, um, the physical spaces exist, but they're not, you know, under the governance or property of the municipality or anything. But what a business needs is uh, some sort of financial or mentoring support, administrative support, whatever. Um, that in looking at this, I think we have to, it would be good to look at um potential for uh developing in a, an incubator that would make use of existing properties i'm thinking of you know vacant storefronts downtown um vacant office space uh, we've got things that are that are around that uh, could be rented could be leased could be um, um obtained by a by a guarantee you know more than just uh looking at um, a building where people are doing things. Mm -hmm. so. 
I think having that type of incubator would actually be a transformative mm -hmm. thing. That would that would open it up to all sorts of enterprises. Yeah. Do we know? Um, has there been any surveying or discussion, or does anybody personally know like what people want or are looking for in something like this? I mean, all I have is my agro example. And that's just because I want them closer to my house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and we have something on um, Jessica Remington shared um, the lacrosse uh, business incubator. Um, and so it looks like this is their website right here. Um, some of the small business resources, things that are made right here. I'd be curious on some some data points they would have in terms of how has this helped um, either bring new businesses to their community? How many are they seeing start as an incubator then end up purchasing bricks and mortar buildings in their community to see? And I think that helps also support the case and also with applying for grants or, or looking for funding when you can see those linear connections of how it's helped their community. I know Eau Claire also has one. So I mean, we have obviously the bigger models in the Twin Cities, but with the Eau Claire and La Crosse markets being a little bit smaller, that might be good data points for us to connect with and understand. Yeah, this is a great um, image to show how they have it structured as well. Well, it looks like they only have three available spaces, so mm -hmm. good sign. that's a good sign. Yeah. Yeah, look at what you said about having data points. I mean, it's fun, at least I think for us to imagine what we want and what it could be, but you know, Getting more information on what's actually needed and what actually works is probably a useful thing. Yep, definitely. Lydia? Uh, I don't remember what I was going to say, oh, but okay. I did just get that. You know, is this an opportunity to like revitalize malls, um, to use a mall and be able to use it differently? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll just give you our experience from Southeast with our makerspace in Red Wing. We had one community partner and ours was not more of a business incubator. It was it was shared tools. It was sharing our tools and those kinds of things. And I think the lesson that's come out of this is that the more community partners you have, uh, the better for a space like this. And so if you do move towards like a makerspace of some kind, um, you know, I think in, involving the school district, involving, um, you know, uh, any any uh, community organizations that are focused on starting businesses and those kinds of things always, uh, always help fill programming and get people to use this space. And so I would just, um, we've just shut down our maker space in Red Wing because we just weren't getting use out of it. But um, so I think that sort of emerged as the lesson is as many community groups and organizations as possible. Definitely. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, all this chatter does make me think Renona has a lot of different things going on that could be considered incubator-ish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and I think it'll probably just be important to, to know what's already out there. Yep. You can just walk around the, you know, the farmer's market and see, you know, some of the things that people are selling or making, you know, there's a lot of food vendors down there now mm -hmm. and, you know, what's their interest and people, you know, really are interested in, um, you know, they'll do it on Saturday. Is it a hobby? Is it something they're interested in expanding on a little bit? But I think there's some groups already in existence that could be tapped to find out what else you know, what else are they interested in? And I would guess a lot of people know somebody like, you know, that makes something that will, you know, gladly come down and help and they might not want to do it all the time. You know, they might want to share space on certain days of the week or, you know, something that would be a service. And I, you know, I, I watch um, like heirloom restaurant downtown. They have a great following, but they'll put out something that says, we just can't be open today because you know we're taking care of our sick child or something. Mm -hmm. And the community, from what I can see, has embraced them mm -hmm. as part of their family and supports them and say, you take care of your family, we'll be back tomorrow. And I, I mean, I love watching that business in particular kind of, you know, be taken under people's wings. Or, you know, it's a young family, they have great food and and it's being talked about. And 
mean, I think they have, they, they don't even know that, you know, people are talking about them so much. Well, I think one thing that, you know, would in along that line is doing a survey of potential uh, incubator space. And, and we mentioned food service mm -hmm. um, and, and food management. Um, there are at least three full scale commercial kitchens in um, Catholic parishes mm -hmm. that uh, as the Catholic schools are being consolidated um, over to Cotter are going to be standing unused, that they're fully equipped Absolutely. to handle mm -hmm. um, school lunch Absolutely. detail. And um, those parishes could certainly use some money. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that there's potential there to uh, you know negotiate uh, something we want to be putting together something for sale at a farmer's market or mm -hmm. a different way. And another thing, I mean, as you're saying, buy-in and uh, having uh, community buy-in and making use of community spaces rather than uh, capital capital investment on the part of the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it, I mean, are we, are we limiting, you know, the conversation to just food or are there other things? Because, you know, I just got back from a week of hiking out in Wyoming and one of the women that I was hiking with is an acupuncturist. She lives in Oatana and as the week went on, we started talking about, hmm, would you come to Winona? Would you open a business? And she's open. I mean, she, yeah, I think, you know, in another few conversations, I think she'd totally come here. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, she just, she doesn't, you know, she don't, doesn't have any, she's an Oatana. She doesn't really have ties to that, but completely willing to embrace this with support. I mean, mm -hmm. she's, you know, we talked about what would you need and how would you need that to happen? And Absolutely. she's all about it. So, I mean, I think sometimes it's that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, when you're, you know, hiking uphill, that it's hard <laughs> trying to figure it out, but, but she, um, I, I know, I, I, you know, I plan to talk to her more about it just because, you know, I want her here. We don't have that service. Let's, I mean, I don't think we have it. We do in the knitting home. Yeah, but in another one, you know, like why not? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's that interest, you know, it's one on one conversations and so often that bring people together. So. Well, and to me too, this uh, the idea for an incubator maker space type of thing fits right in with uh, one of the key values that we identified right away uh, at the onset of this project when we took a look at the vision and values for 2045. And one of those values, um, one of our four key values is entrepreneurship, um, just given the history of Winona um, and so many things that have started here. I'm looking at fast now, you know. Um, but you know, especially um, there's been a lot of talk or, or what I've heard over the past however many years as, you know, some of the businesses that started here, you know, the legacy companies to a certain extent, um, you know, are, are reaching, you know, maturity and, and some of them are being sold and that type of thing. There's concern about, okay, what's going to happen next? Who's going to be the next innovator in Winona and that type of thing? And so to look at a project like this, I think fits uh, right in with that and hopefully to help um, kind of answer that question of, you know, okay, what comes next? What is the next idea? It also helps address that another concern that's been brought up in this <clears throat> process is what happens to our uh, our young people um, that uh, we have that grain of uh, 20 to 40 mm -hmm. um, people with high energy, high skills. And I think that we a way to uh, help them turn their ideas into a reality. And maybe easily see themselves staying here. Pardon me? And to easily see themselves staying yeah. here, starting yeah. something. Or yeah. coming back when they get a start. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, how many how many people uh, graduate from uh, Winona State or St. Mary's and say, geez, I'd love to be come back to Winona, but I don't. And then I can't because of. Um, this may give them, could give them a way to, a reason to come back. Definitely. And I think this is where, I think, you know, Southeast in particular, I mean, we have mechatronics, electronics, tool and die, carpentry, welding, you know. So, so on that industrial side, we, you know, 
it, it really just be setting up the system that allowed some of those I have a cool invention and I don't want to give it to fast and all, um, you know, one of their workers to come in and, you know, play around with this and create these things, you know, and if it was outside of our educational programs, it would just be setting up the system for them to use our tools and, and to be on campus. And so I think um, in, in that area, I think the college has a lot to offer um, on the industrial side. And to go back to what you said before, I mean, I definitely don't think it would need to be just food. I, mm -hmm. I use that as an easy example, yeah. and I yeah, think it's right? you know yeah. the more obvious one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd be curious like what a good mix is, like what other places mm -hmm. have done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely not just food, but mm -hmm. yeah. there's definitely there's definitely an interest in in uh, um, providing a, a studio space uh, for um, visual artists mm -hmm. and. Uh, in town in and that's a great transition into what I have next. Thank you. I didn't know you were doing it, but <laughs> uh, glad to be of service. <laughs> the next document I have here comes from our arts plan, uh -huh. and uh, it's the goal number four. And I'll bring it up for those who are here uh, on Zoom. And so goal four has to do with expanding access to creative sector uh, facilities and spaces. And this is geared towards arts, um, but it also includes live workspaces for creatives. And I, you know, with creatives, I think, we of course, include uh, people who are creating new food-based businesses as well, or new product-based businesses uh, as well. There's a lot of um, emphasis from the Marine Art Museum on their new Five-year plan on the culture and our teams. Wonderful, yeah, exactly. And so, um, the arts plan will be rolled into the comprehensive plan um, by incorporating um, the goals and the main um, strategies uh, that are in here. So, the goal, this goal, will be incorporated right into our comp plan, um, as well as the subheadings uh, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. Kind of the subheadings that you see in here, the 4.11, 12, and 13, those won't be in the plan. They will live in the arts plan um, so that they can be added to or modified individually outside of the comp plan. Just a process uh, thing. But um, just for your information, it, it does talk again about the Masonic Temple, and then it gets into um, inventory and making available existing public spaces for creative activities. And to um, what Jerome was um, talking a little bit about is developing live workspaces for artists and creatives, including mixed use product uh, projects. So, you know, in addition to an incubator space, what if your incubator was downstairs and you lived upstairs, that type of thing. It's that art space model um, that has been um, successful in some larger cities, but um, looking at what are opportunities for us to be able to do something like that here in Winona as well. And then we do also have this uh, last part, which is a creative space program to incentivize new facilities, spaces, and places. And in this scenario, who provides technical assistance to guidance checking facilities based project? Is this, um, what is the city's role in, say, like making this happen or making an incubator space happen? Yeah, so for instance, the Port Authority was involved in the, um, the garage uh, space sure. that started. Unfortunately, it's not open any longer, but you know, I, maybe lessons to be taken from that. Um, but I do see the Port Authority, our economic development arm of the city, playing a role in something uh, of an incubator space, definitely. This actually brings up a question. Like, so what did we learn from that? So what about the garage space, where I feel like is, is like one, is inching closer to some of this vision? Like, like what caused that to fail or not work in our community? We're in Red Wing, I think it, it thrives. Red, Red, Red Wing Ignite, I think tends to have a lot of programming. So like, what, what were the differences or what were the learnings from that that we could apply um, to as we think about a newer model for Winona? 
Yeah, and then, yeah, I'd have to do a little bit of research on that. I don't know, uh, Luke, if you have any background on that. Um, but um, yeah, and Luke is shaking his head too. But that's something that we could incorporate into um, the write-up for this idea. Uh, basically, one of the considerations would be why didn't the, why isn't the garage still uh, in its current space? So definitely. Okay. Any other comments or questions related to this here? From the discussion, it, it feels like this almost needs to be a an organization or department or an institution that then supports a variety of different activities and locations versus a building. It needs to be a, a way our city can support, whether it be arts or business or entrepreneurs or what they all need is a funding source and some support. It's not necessarily a building or a space they need as much as is just that support to get off the ground. And is the is this idea uh, another arm of our city government or something that that provides the funding and the source and the resources for these people to start up and get a business going? Definitely, and I would concur with that. You know, I don't think that this necessarily needs to be focused on one specific place or one specific area um, it should also be related to uh, programming and incentivizing something like this to or for wherever um, it wherever it works best for somebody to be able to make something happen mm -hmm. and i'm guessing if you look into the garage it had nothing to do with the location or space it had to do with the the programming and operational ability to sustain itself yep So uh, on that note, then, um, you know, as we think about an, an incubator business space, like what other accompanying city policies or changes from like a systems level infrastructure would we want to consider to help create a more favorable environment for people to be successful at starting a business? Are there some that come to mind already? Sorry, I just jumped on because that was a great question. <laughs> no, that is a great question. And I really wish Lucy McMartin was here sure. uh, right now. Because um, off the top of my head, I don't have anything for you. Sure. But so. it'd be like code stuff or yep. ordinances or. Yep. Yeah. And so um, the art plan does talk a little bit about that. Um, review and streamline permitting and other regulations to facilitate art uses mm -hmm. and existing buildings, provide incentives to property owners, landlords uh, for adaptive reuse of their properties. And, you know, I, I can say just from a land use perspective, that's also one thing that we're leaning into heavy with this uh, comprehensive plan is introducing mixed use into a lot of uh, additional areas into the city. So right now we have a land use designation that's basically just commercial. And what we're doing is saying that no, all those uh, commercial uses, uh, land use designations from 2007, at least preliminarily, and this is where the land use subcommittee uh, comes in, um, all those commercial areas should be mixed use. We should introduce more uses uh, to these areas um, so that you can have people living and either working or creating something in the same space. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that makes so much sense. Yeah, I, th I think that you know among the among the things that would be, be valuable, um, having a program of loan guarantees that uh, to assist people in securing finance, um, financing um, again the changing the uh, changing uh, zoning and and uh, other regulations to encourage home based. The neighborhood-based um, enterprise, um, you know, I had for years, a guy 
ran <clears throat> um, under the under the radar of a motorcycle repair business. <laughs> Kitty Wolf was from my uh, from my house. Nobody in the neighborhood cared him except we had to do some tuning at some odd hour and <laughs> had the mufflers on. But it uh, you know the, there are a number of things like that can be accommodated and. Um, you know, I think that uh, running it through uh, Port Authority Community Development um, is a is a, is a really viable way of doing it. I think the other, I was going to say, uh, sorry, Carlos. Um, another important thing is uh, people usually are focused on their product or their service that they're really you know have a passion about, but being in proximity and having you know. Uh, a community of other people who are getting into the business world. Cause those are a different set of skills typically than whatever it is, you know, like making egg rolls or you know, look at Jovi, right? She's in making jewelry, but she has a viable business in a prime location. Now, how do you get from the concept to there being around people who help you understand appropriate capitalization, appropriate marketing, you know, not taking on too many resources too soon, but not, you know, stifling yourself when you obviously have market available to you, you know, helping people find that balance, you know, and, and whether it's peers working in the same space as them or community uh, professionals who can, you know, help guide some of that. And along with that, you know, the, the complications of human resources and, and other things that you need to have as a business that a lot of these actors probably don't necessarily have the skill set nor can afford to hire it. Right. You know, there is some basic business infrastructure that these people can tie into to, to give that business the support they need to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. Jumping on that, um, especially uh, with Jovi, you know, one of her uh, neighbors on the block is Ripple Leaf talk to the you know kids the young people that own that store um very impressive what they're doing with that um and it sounds like one of the challenges they have is um is finding you know legal and accounting advice mm -hmm. uh, that works well for them and so perhaps you know but one of the advantages they have is being on that block and being next to jovi um you know being next to green thumb they get that business support and so that sort of leads me to you know thinking about sort of the combination of that physical and non-physical support coming together to help people. It makes me think a little bit about the lived experience program, um, but focused on entrepreneurship or makerspace. And, you know, if there's a certain timeline, you know, is this a, a university of sorts, you know, like a, um, where whoever is, facilitating this can tap into those different spaces and those different people and um, and be able to kind of tailor, you know, a semester's worth of get your business off to a start and people sign up for it. Or I don't know exactly how the lived experience thing works. I, and it's, uh, it's on the close to it. I understand it. But, but that they're mm -hmm. buying into the support and, and, people pointing them in the right direction um, and, and just helping navigate the complexity of a, of a big idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, finding ways to tap into uh, community expertise with the mm -hmm. chamber, with the uh, right. universities, mm -hmm. technical college. The chamber has a really cool resource that is just how to start a business. And it has mm -hmm. like all these resources um, and and a step by step guide, um, which is really nice. But having a person talk you through the realities and the hiccups that you might run into, and yeah, it would would get you further. A clearinghouse. I mean, I think that that's one of the one of the functions that the that the uh, um, economic development uh, department can provide is a is, is a clearinghouse to for all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one thing we talked about um, in the downtown subcommittee a lot is that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of different groups that do things, um, but it's not always brought together and you know not always as clear. Mm -hmm. This sounds similar. There's a lot of resources available, but it might not always be easy for one business, one person to go and find all that on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the example I can think of, you know, at least for me anyway, is the difference between the chamber and Visit Winona. 
to me is kind of is one of those places where I you know I often wonder you know well which do I go to because <laughs> I don't you know because you don't know necessarily who does what and what's the function and you know I've gone to one and they said no I don't go here go there you know you get that back and forth kind of thing when I you know I think there's more they're more similar than different and how do we you know you know how do we merge all of the good you know resources that we have here without you know being territorial or being you know not you know just honoring everyone's place and and making you know making it serve the bigger you know the, the bigger group of us and then you know and then you know kind of part two is we have a you know we have a lot of older um business owners who you know, I, I can think of two right now. One's my brother, one's my cousin, and my brother owns the sawmill out in Minnesota City. He delivers pallets to every single business in this town. He's 71 years old. He's got, you know, it may not be he needs somebody to take the business, but he has a wealth of knowledge about things that he's done, ways that he's developed young people into, you know, serving others. And he never loses employees. There's, I mean, there's something about that. But my my cousin, who owns a tile company, saw him this morning, and he said, "You know, I'm ready to retire. There's nobody to take my business. Nobody." And that, I mean, that's a that's a sad statement because everyone needs both those services in this town. I and mean, I don't know, you know, my brother makes sixty different kinds of pallets. No one knows that. <laughs> And he, you know, fast and all buys from him. I manufacturing. Everybody buys from him. And that's and and that's where the where this type of uh, cleaning house would work in in a different way. In yeah. Bringing, bringing potential uh, potential buyers together with uh, somebody who's ready to retire. Yeah. Or even potential mentors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, uh, that's something you know they want to be able to you know. Be able to help somebody else, you know, with their experience. It kind of reminds me, of, you know, my mom told me, you know, when she worked on campaigns, it often have kind of old timers that never really wanted to go on a door knock or call anybody, but they kept them on staff because it's really helpful to have their long their experience. Yeah. Exactly. Of course. Um, and again, all this, like, at least in my mind, still comes back to some sort of physical space. You know, maybe you do have, you know, visit Winona and, you know, a chamber person, you know, sort of at it's the same table. You could ask. Who do I talk to for what? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a mentorship corner, you know, some yeah. a place where you can actually go and access that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. I'll, I'll, just, I'll add one more thing. Yeah. Sorry. So I mean, no. kind of building off that, I mean, in terms of building out the infrastructure for success. Um, I think about when I had, when we were working on starting up our business, I mean, I had to drive to Rochester, connected through the SBA to talk with someone who was willing to provide legal counsel for 30 minutes, you could get set up for a 30 minute slot. And then I found a guy who could talk with about trademarks and copyrights. So how, how do we source that within our own community to build that? So with any building that we would have, also making sure there's those connections with expertise within our, kind of what lives in our community somewhere, but um, just building the infrastructure for that to accompany it. And I think a lot of this too revolves around um, uh, one of the things that keeps on coming up throughout the uh, comprehensive plan subcommittees that we've been talking about, and that's communication, mm -hmm. getting the word out about what programs are out there, what services are available, because there's a lot out there, but people, have a hard time understanding um, what's there. And it's so much more important now um, to be able to get the word out on, you know, non-digital, digital, digital um, on the different social media platforms. You kind of have to do it all. And that's where communication is something that we're seeing amongst every, every committee is saying that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. We just need to be able to be better at getting the word out mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, and helping people understand where that word is. Exactly. You know, because they don't, I don't think people, you know, they don't know. They start, you know, looking, you know, digging around for things and then they get frustrated and they either stop or they, you know, or they might call Rochester or something, I mean, something that they may be able to get, you know, on somebody else's website, a connection that we might not, you know, have figured out yet or, you know, been able to, you know, make better. 
um, so people can access and you know we can we can never get too good at communicating and mm -hmm. don't think yeah. okay any other comments or questions any any other things uh people would like to bring up just a question sure uh so looking we kind of came up at the end of last time when we we're thinking like with the field house like is this something we want to do or not or how do we think about this um and looking ahead to uh the the last topic the community center of public safety building is there do you have in mind a method by which we as a subcommittee will kind of vote or officially sort of say this is what we want to say for as a community or not say or we're not sure what you know do you have a process do we need a quorum i mean i don't yeah, so um, eventually all of our committees are getting to the point where um, we'll have a, a document, a draft of what we'd like to include in the comprehensive plan, and it will be uh, a vote of this committee to actually send that to the steering committee. And so what we'd like to do, um, perhaps in the next few meetings here, is identify um, a speaker or somebody who would be willing to go to the steering committee and present our slate of projects and talk a little bit about them. Um, so in order for us to start working on, um, you know, which projects those would be, um, what I've uh, started at least is um, the document that I presented when we first uh, started this committee. Um, and it that's related to the uh, Duluth um, example, where for each project, we'd have a rationale. So talk about why we think this is transformative and describe the project itself. Um, partnerships, um, so who's needed in order to make a project happen. Which I think we had some great discussion on that today. And then considerations um, for each project. Um, so examples are like, um, why was the garage not successful here? Um, why are the uh, maker spaces uh, successful in uh, Eau Claire and La Crosse? Um, so that'll all be encapsulated into uh, perhaps a one or two pager um, that we'll review as a committee and um, vote on whether we want to uh, include those in the overall product or not. So. Do you have a deadline on that or a time? I mean, you said in the next few meetings, then we'll come up with what that plan will look like. And and yeah, so we're at what we'd like to do is have something to the steering committee by September. Okay. Yep. So we're scheduling two steering committee meetings in September. Um, and so what we'd like to do is start to firm things up uh, towards the end of August. Steering committee would meet in September and um, kind of the next, the timeline is putting together a draft plan by the end of October. So the first draft of the comprehensive plan will be done by the end of October and go up for public comment prior to the holiday. So about that three week period in the beginning of November. Then everybody will go on vacation for a month. And <laughs> when we get back um, in 2023, early 2023 is what we'd like to uh, have a time frame for a second draft, additional public input on that second draft, and then enter the adoption phase in uh, second quarter of 2023. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Well, just a comment on discussion from today is that this is probably of all of our meetings. I find this to be the most encouraging in that it appears that virtually all of the elements to make this makerspace slash incubator are, are in place in one way or another. Um, it's a matter of bringing them together, coordinating them, and um, providing some uh, some support, financial and uh, personnel support, and and water. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is a very doable, a very doable thing. We don't have to uh, uh, come up with huge amounts of money or discover tracts uh, of land. Or, you know, so I I just find that. You know, really encouraging. <laughs> I I and it, it's, it's nice to have something that we can say we can do this. Yeah. yeah. And um to be back on that, somebody had asked earlier, you know, what you know, 
what's required to make it considered transformative. Um, I mean, to me, if I can walk instead of drive my ankles, that's a big transformation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, I think the bar for success, you know, considering it's a success is pretty low, but the possibility for what it could become mm -hmm. is also quite high. Yeah. And to me, that's exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we're coming up on the end of our meeting here. And as always, we want to try and schedule our next one. Uh, two weeks out would be August 3rd. How does that work for people? Relatively good. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. Yep, yep okay. that's fine. Wonderful. We'll look at um, August 3rd then at 1.30, and we'll talk about housing. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it. And we'll see you in another couple of weeks here. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Luke or Carlos, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually, I just got an email from um, someone from the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. Okay. And it sounds like they're visiting Winona. Are they visiting you in Winona? Because they're asking me if I wanted to meet with them to discuss local housing market issues. How might those be impacting recruitment and retention within our organization? We're hearing in our visits around the state about housing shortages of all kinds. Um, and I just wanted to know from the city's perspective, have you been included in any of those? And if not, I'd be happy to have you join me in the conversation. I haven't reached out to them yet. Sure. Um, let me uh, check around City Hall here and I will send you an email. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.